This episode of The Sweaty Penguin is brought to you by Clownfish. Do you hate when you ask your fish to make a balloon animal and it says, No, I don't know how! Try Clownfish today! Welcome to episode 57 of The Sweaty Penguin, Antarctica's hottest podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Brown. It is Friday, September 10th. You can subscribe to The Sweaty Penguin on Apple, Spotify, Google, Podcast Addict, wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to leave a five-star rating and a review, and you will get a shout-out at the end of the show. The other way to get a shout out, join our Patreon. For as little as five bucks a month, you'll also get access to some Sweaty Penguin swag, exclusive bonus content, and more. You can do that by heading over to patreon.com slash the Sweaty Penguin. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash peril and promise. Today, we are talking about white wine, because if we called it urine-colored wine, it probably wouldn't sell as well. Actually, we'll talk about both red and white wine today, and even that pink stuff everyone loves to post on Instagram with captions like, Rosé is bay, and when there's a will, there's a rosé. And before you turn this off because you think I'm going to ruin wine, I promise you, I am not. That's what middle school health teachers are for. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that producing glass bottles and transporting those heavy bottles of wine around the world creates carbon emissions, and I'm not going to mention that there could be minor issues here and there with pesticides, fertilizers, and water, and I wouldn't so much as deign to bring up that many parts of the U.S. and world don't recycle glass bottles because, honestly, we looked into all of those issues, and they weren't that concerning. Of course, we could make glass recycling more economical, and maybe we could figure out why there's occasional banned pesticide residues in wine. And perhaps it could be worth helping smaller wineries with water efficiency. And sure, it's probably worth finding more carbon-efficient ways to transport wine, especially overseas. But really, that's all pretty simple. Just like most foods and drinks, wine has some nagging issues that are always improving, but certainly nothing bad enough to ruin it for us. We're not a five-year-old in a board game store. We can't expect perfection. But even though wine isn't ruining the climate, climate change might be ruining wine. Just listen to this news story from 2017, when the California wildfires reached the vineyards of Napa Valley. Hundreds of thousands of acres in Northern California are burning. It's epic. So Mother Nature's a bit cranky this year. She's thrown a lot at us, you know? A lot of this charred land is all that's left of the region's main export, wine. Vineyards burned, barrels smoked out, an industry at a complete standstill. I'm sorry, did he just call Mother Nature cranky? I was certain I would never come across someone blaming climate change on a woman's mood, but clearly I was mistaken. I mean, if starting wildfires is cranky, I'd hate to see what Mother Nature angry would look like. This clip was from 2017, and it's one of a long list of fires scorching vineyards in Australia, southern France, and of course, the western United States over the last few years. In fact, California, Oregon, and Washington are both the top three producers of wine in the United States, and though different sites have variations on the rankings, Move.org also ranks California, Oregon, and Washington as the three most dangerous states for wildfires. If wildfires can, as this news story suggests, burn down vineyards and put a region's wine industry at a standstill, you can see pretty clearly already how big a threat climate change poses to wine. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Climate change affects wine in so many different ways, and in an increasingly globalized and competitive market where many vineyards are already struggling, these climate impacts might just be too much to handle. So today, we'll discuss the climate issues facing wine production, what that means for vineyards around the world, and how the wine industry could adapt moving forward. So let's jump right in, because I don't need to define what wine is today. Obviously, as my aunt signed in her kitchen says, wine is bay. 
I do want to set the scene a little bit, though, before we get into climate issues, because as it turns out, wine is a pretty intriguing industry on its own. When we think of fine wine, when we pay 500 bucks a bottle, swirl a little bit in our glass, and comment on the dry, texturally sophisticated, warm-bodied finish containing notes of plum, linzer tort, and pure chalk, we're most likely talking about wine from France. Famous wine regions like Burgundy, Bordeaux, Manischewitz. Manischewitz actually isn't so much a wine region as a wine shtetl, but I digress. France has a long history of producing some of the best and most expensive wines in the world, with vineyards getting handed down generation after generation. And actually, this is in large part due to the fact that France has the perfect climate, soil, and topography for wine growth, a phenomenon that the French call terroir. Wine is a part of culture in France, and over 24 million foreigners visit France's wine regions every year, 23.9 million of whom don't bother to learn French. But recently, France has started facing some competition. Italy and Spain have increasingly been beating France out as the world's largest wine producer, and the United States and China are right on their heels with extremely fast-growing industries. At the same time, global wine consumption has been declining since 2017, according to the International Organization of Vine and Wine, with the pandemic hitting fine wine especially hard when restaurants had to close. I'm not going to speculate as to why consumption has gone down, although I will tell you the Wall Street Journal actually blamed it on millennials, but whether it's millennials' fault or TikTok's fault or Elijah from Passover's fault, this combination of more and more producing regions and declining consumption has led French wine growers into market competition they've never faced before. Is that a bad thing? Depends who you ask. If you ask Italy or Spain or the US or China, they'd probably say it's a good thing. That if a country wants to join the industry, they should get their shot. But some French wine growers have reacted very differently. Take the CRAV, which in English stands for the Regional Committee for Viticultural Action. The CRAV is a group of militant French wine producers who have actually been classified by many as a terrorist group, having committed arson, bombings, and other attacks on government buildings and any place where imported wine might be. That's right. I never thought I'd say the words wine and terrorist in the same sentence on this podcast, but here we are. And according to the University of Chichester's Dr. Andrew Smith, the CRAV largely exists because of this increasingly globalized market. That's one of the demands that you see cravists make. You know, they say, well, we produce, we produce this much wine. If it's not selling, then we should stop all imports. You know, that's the kind of demand, which in some ways is kind of common sense, I guess, but it's also functionally impossible for the state to kind of pull out of all its international obligations for the favor of a regional industry. And that's the kind of the tragedy of it in some ways. So there are, uh, I think, um, it is a function of opening up to the world. It is a function of engaging in global markets. Obviously, arson and bombing are bad. You learn that, like, the first day of kindergarten. That said, Dr. Smith's suggestion that the globalization of the wine industry led to the anger and frustration that fuels the Krav makes sense. According to Dr. Smith, the Krav feels domestic wine should take precedence over foreign wine, despite any trade barriers that might require. Now, French wines actually do sell at higher prices than other wines, since people are willing to pay extra to get French wine. And you would think that would be the exact leg up French wine growers need to bolster their business. But instead... It's just led to cases of fraud, where Spanish wine gets imported to France, someone slaps a French label on it, and then jacks up the price. That's not to say life would be easy for French wine growers without this fraud and the crave would disappear, but between the globalization Dr. Smith discusses and this fraud, you can see why there would be such discontent among French wine growers, even though arson and bombing probably aren't too constructive of a solution. So we've got Italy, Spain, China, and the United States fighting their way onto the global wine stage. We've got France struggling so much that some wine growers have resorted to violence. Now, 
Let's throw climate change at everyone and see what happens. Much like Bachelor in Paradise throwing in Kendall, the drama goes from spicy to completely out of control. Seriously, did you see how traumatized Grocery Store Joe looked in Episode 1? Can we just let him be happy with Serena? Is that really too much to ask? Like Grocery Store Joe, grapevines are very sensitive. Not to reuniting with exes, but to changes in climate. That's not to say you can't grow grapes anymore when the climate changes, since you actually usually can. But each type of grape has a range of temperatures spanning about 2 to 4 degrees Celsius, where if the grape is grown within that range, it will produce a good wine. If it's a little bit outside that range, you can probably still grow the grapes, but you might not get the same yields, or they might not come out as well, or they might ripen too early, much like my armpits when they started growing hair in fifth grade. Do you know how awkward it is for a 10-year-old boy to know what nair is? Grapes ripening too quickly and too early is actually a challenge many vineyards are dealing with right now. According to a study by the European Geosciences Union, wine grape harvests now begin 13 days earlier than they did prior to 1988, and when the grapes ripen too fast, they may not properly develop their tannins and anthocyanins, which are compounds responsible for the skin and color of the grapes, and the resulting wine can come out syrupy and unpleasant. Amazingly, even within the small climate range each grape variety has, you'll see differences in the wines. Pinot Noir grapes, for example, have a range of 14 to 16 degrees Celsius, but grapes grown closer to the 14 would tend to produce a lighter-bodied, lighter-colored wine, and grapes grown closer to the 16 would tend to produce a fuller-bodied, darker-colored wine. Since pre-industrial times, the world has already warmed by about 1 degree Celsius, so already you can see some grapes might start to be affected. Most grapes can still be grown, but the wines might taste slightly different. But what if we look into the future? Take Burgundy. No, not the San Diego Anchorman, but the equally classy wine region in France. According to Southern Oregon University's Dr. Gregory Jones, a place like Burgundy that currently produces Pinot Noir and Chardonnay could see some pretty big changes. If we look at conservative estimates of warming in the future, Burgundy will likely end up here. The climatic envelope will be on the warm upper end for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. It doesn't remove them from the ability to produce those wines, but what it does is it changes the wine style overall framework that they can produce there. Um, if, we, if we look at this though, this is a conservative projection of climate in the future. What happens if it changes to more extremes that we kind of th tend to think might happen? This would put Burgundy in a completely different framework, where only the coolest of places can potentially uh, ripen fruit in the future. According to Dr. Jones, the wines would most certainly change in style, and depending on how bad the warming is, you could even see parts of Burgundy become unsuitable for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. At this rate, Burgundy is losing fine wines faster than the Baltimore Ravens are losing offensive weapons. John Harbaugh, why would you play that many starters in the preseason? Sammy Watkins and Rashad Bateman are already injured, and now J.K. Dobbins is out for the season? I know we joke that Lamar Jackson is a running back because he runs instead of throwing the football every play, but at least let him have the option to give someone else the ball. He can throw, too. It's not like he's Cam Newton. And it's not just Burgundy losing its famous wines. If every wine region stuck to the same grape varieties they've been growing for generations, 2 degrees Celsius of warming would mean the regions of the world suitable for growing wine grapes could shrink by as much as 56%, according to a study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Now, I did mention that different grape varieties like different climates, and in fact Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, are on the cooler end of the spectrum. So couldn't Burgundy start making Sauvignon Blanc or another slightly warmer climate wine? Yeah, they could. In fact, the study I mentioned earlier found if wine regions grew new grape varieties, suitable wine regions would reduce by only 24%, as opposed to the 56% if they didn't try to adapt. But tell that to the wineries that have been putting famous Burgundy Pinot Noirs and Chardonnays on the shelves for generations and kept records of their harvests that date back to the 1300s. 
Tell that to the growers, who consider their specific wine a fundamental part of their culture. Tell that to the millions of tourists that come to Burgundy each year to learn about Burgundy wines and their historic roots. Sure, Burgundy will be able to make wines in the future, but will it sell as well if it's a different wine? Or the same wine that tastes slightly different? We really can't say. But if you've ever met a wine snob, I think you can see why this might be a problem. So even though Dr. Jones is talking about little changes to the wine style, or small regional shifts in the ability to grow certain grapes, in the world of wine, that's a really big deal. And it doesn't stop there. Remember when we talked before about how the industry is already struggling to cope with the increasing globalization and market competition? Well, when a region can't keep producing a certain wine, an area just north of it now can. In other words, that global competition can suddenly steepen even more. Suddenly, we're seeing wine production in Russia, England, Sweden, Finland, Canada, Belgium. In fact, in Belgium, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay are now two of the most grown grape varieties, and between 2006 and 2018, Belgian wine production quadrupled. That's right, Belgium had time to do that and still crank out beer, waffles, and a win over the US in the 2014 World Cup that imploded our team and has kept us out of the World Cup ever since. Look, I don't care how old he is, can we please put Tim Howard back at goalie? But all these issues I've mentioned have to do with averages, which is very unlike me. If you've learned two things about climate change on this podcast, it's that polar bears can't pass a phys ed swim test, and that climate change worsens extremes. It's not that every day is a couple degrees hotter. It's that we're seeing way hotter hot days and way colder cold days. We're seeing wet areas get wetter, dry areas get drier, on fire areas get more on fire. So what does that mean for wine? Well, I mentioned fires before, which can certainly make an impact. I do want to point out that much like Edna's supersuits in The Incredibles, grapevines are actually quite resilient to fire. They can dissipate fires, shed burnt leaves, and continue producing grapes even after a fire passes through. A bad fire can certainly put a winery at a standstill, but according to an article in Wine Economics and Policy, the winery will bounce back fast. But remember those picky wine drinkers. If a grapevine was on fire, or even just exposed to ash and soot in the air, the wine in all likelihood will come out tasting a little smoky. That might work in something like a Syrah, but certainly not most wines. I've heard even Smokey the Bear prefers a smoke-free Cabernet. How about water? If it's too dry, there's obviously going to be problems since grapes require water to grow. Vines are actually more tolerant to water deficiency than other crops, and even can grow longer roots during droughts as they search for a water source. But too much stress can hinder photosynthesis, delay or inhibit bud ripening, lower winter hardiness, or cause the vine to stop producing altogether. The soil in drought conditions could also be prone to erosion or even become unsuitable for plant life. At the same time, overly wet conditions can also create problems. Severe floods can leave vineyards underwater, too much rain can lead to watery grapes, and too much humidity can lead to pests, fungi, and diseases. That's right, even grapes get sick. And obviously, whenever a sick grape takes some grape-flavored Robitussin, their friends all call them cannibal, so it really puts grapes in a tough spot. Add extreme temperatures to the mix, and the pest and disease problem gets even worse. First off, I should say that growers do use pesticides throughout the year to keep pests under control, though not to any degree you'd need to be concerned about from a health perspective. Besides small traces of banned substances here and there, studies such as one by Decanter in 2013 have found pesticide residues are present, but not at toxic levels. But more importantly, if you're worried about the health impact of wine, you know wine is 12% alcohol, right? I mean, drink what you want, but no amount of antioxidants is going to make wine healthy for you. But back to temperature. One of the best controls for pests and diseases on grapevines is the winter, when the frost actually kills them off. With fewer frosts in the winter, sometimes pests and diseases linger. 
Wine growers are very good at their jobs, unless they make Zinfandel, so I don't expect that fewer frosts would lead to mass grape die-offs or growers dumping pesticides everywhere, but this certainly does create a problem for them, and it is important to be sure excessive pesticide use isn't a go-to solution. And beyond pests, extreme temperatures can also affect the growth of the grapes themselves. According to Sharon Roeder of Virginia's Barrel Oak Winery, temperature swings can actually be devastating. We're getting hot, hot days in the middle of the winter and cold days in the middle of the summer. And that, for the grapevines, they start to wake up and they start thinking, gosh, is it, is it time? That's scary. If they do bud out, then get cold again and you can have a serious frost event and that'll ruin a whole crop. It's heartwarming that Mr. Heatmiser and Mr. Snowmiser can put their differences aside, but according to Sharon, a hot day followed by a frost can ruin a whole crop. She's experienced it in Virginia, but it's happening all over the world. Just this last April, France saw temperatures drop in a day from 26 degrees Celsius or 79 degrees Fahrenheit down to negative 4 degrees Celsius or 25 degrees Fahrenheit. In one day, it went from a hot summer day to below freezing, a drop that the French National Meteorological Service called the most drastic since 1947. 80% of French vineyards were damaged, with up to a third of wine production, valued at almost 2 billion euros, gone. Hearing Sharon's experience with extreme temperature swings, you can see why these climate-induced frosts would upend the industry the way they are. So did I ruin wine? I really hope I didn't, at least not more so than climate change has. Besides me saying wine is 12% alcohol, nothing I said should sway you from enjoying it. That said, it is important we understand how climate change is impacting wine, because while we'll always have wine, we might not always have a lighter-bodied Burgundy Pinot Noir, or the same exact tasting Malbec from Bordeaux. And for wine growers to adapt, consumers and tourists can't hold them to that standard. If our Pinot Noir comes from England, and our Malbec comes from Oregon, and it tastes good, there really isn't anything wrong with that. Assuming we as consumers give that leeway, wine growers actually have a lot of options when it comes to climate adaptation. You can find ways to shade vines to protect them from heat, or otherwise cover them to protect from extreme precipitation. You can adopt new water management strategies to handle increasing drought. One viticulturalist named Liz Ridley actually has been working to create a wine grape sunscreen to protect grapes from sunburn. Of course, that would create a whole new problem of grape tan lines, but hopefully they're not too obvious. Beyond that, wine growers may have to consider more drastic changes, either moving to new land, growing new grape varieties, or in some cases, growing something else. According to Hochschul Geisenheim University's Dr. Hans Reiner Schultz, wine growers must become more flexible to see success in a changing climate. Grape growers and winemakers have to be much more flexible today because the fluctuations between vintages, but also within a vintage, how suddenly the situations are changing are much more accentuated than we used to have. If you're not flexible, you're lost. If you're not flexible, you're lost. It's not just true for gymnasts. That statement from Dr. Schultz suggests that wine growers have to be able to make changes. And that brings us to policy, because in some regions, it's not even up to them. In old world regions like Bordeaux, the grapes and blends that vineyards can grow are actually prescribed by law. It's not just the culture of the wine growers and their families, but it's the culture of the region. In 2019, Bordeaux did show some flexibility by approving seven varieties of interest for adapting to climate change, so perhaps that will allow wine growers the leeway they need. But just the fact that regions have such laws puts growers in a really tough spot. Laws aren't known for being flexible, unless you're really good at tax evasion. But according to Dr. Schultz, flexibility is going to be an absolute must. For regions to continue their success in the wine industry, these tough conversations about climate change will most certainly have to continue. At the same time, policymakers might need to be involved when it comes to interacting with the global market. If wine growers are moving, or a region is trying new grapes, maybe that region needs some extra support. 
Alternatively, countries may find it within their economic interest to cooperate with each other and do away with tariffs to have a more fair global market. Seeing the Krav demand tariffs on imported wine is interesting to me, because a better win-win may be the U.S. revoking their tariffs on French wines. We've discussed how tariffs often lead to unintended economic consequences in episodes like Rare Earth Minerals and International Accountability, so more tariffs could certainly create issues here too. That said, there certainly needs to be a solution for the issue of Spanish wine being fraudulently labeled as French wine, and I don't quite see how tariffs on Spanish wine would solve it, but maybe some type of enforcement mechanism could, or just some positive reinforcement to help Spanish wine's self-esteem. Don't hide behind French labels, Spanish wine. You're cool too. Obviously, it sucks to think an industry steeped in culture and tradition like wine could change. While there's nothing wrong with more countries entering a lucrative industry, it's unfortunate that climate change means famous wine regions can't produce the same product they have been for hundreds of years. But if we understand what's going on, and we plan ahead, we could hopefully reach an outcome where you can still get your favorite wine, growers can stay in business, and maybe, just maybe, we won't have to worry about Mother Nature's mood swings. Do you need help hiding from Ellen DeGeneres? If so, clownfish are for you. A new study found young clownfish on coastal reefs are dying faster due to exposure to artificial light. But what do you expect when you ditch your dad and we can't find you? Ugh, kids. Clownfish. The only time a clown school is justified. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Welcome back to The Sweaty Penguin. With me today is Dr. Michelle Moyer, Associate Professor of Viticulture and Enology at Washington State University. Dr. Moyer, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ethan. First off, could you give us an overview of what exactly your job is and how you got into this world of wine as an academic discipline? That is a great question and is actually one that I sometimes ask myself or my family asks me from, from time to time. So Ethan, I'm a very different type of professor or academic, if you will. I am what we call an extension specialist. So rather than um, research as being a primary focus or teaching in the classroom to undergraduate students being a, a primary focus, my primary target audience are grape growers. So I'm kind of a professor for the uh, general public or the producing aspect of, of the world. Um, how I got here is, is also kind of an interesting story. So I grew up in agriculture, right? So I, I lucked out in that aspect. I am from a rural location in Southern Wisconsin and my family ran a landscaping company in an ornamental landscaping or nursery, right? So I kind of grew up with that. When I was thinking about college and in grad school, of course, I wanted nothing to do with that, right? I was everything that I could possibly do to not do what my family did. So I went to the school at University of Wisconsin in Madison, declared genetics major in the College of Ag, realized immediately that I was with all med students and didn't want to spend the rest of my life with that particular group. No offense to the medical people. You guys are doing an awesome job, just not my cup of tea. And was kind of like just thumbing through the little brochures that all schools have on, so you want to be a whatever. And uh, a, a particular discipline called plant pathology popped up, which is like being a doctor, but for plants. And I was like, hey, I like that. Plants don't talk back. I can still kind of do the whole house you know, medical doctor figuring out disease symptoms, but it's on plants. And so I, I enrolled with that and it didn't take many more coursework. So I could double major in those two things. And I realized I loved that. I absolutely loved plant pathology. And so I was thinking, okay, what, what am I going to do with plant pathology when I get out of school? There's a lot of options. And so I, I talked to my academic advisor, one of the few times that an academic advisor actually helps you with career choices, right? So I talked to my advisor and she's like, you know, Michelle, you could go to grad school. To do this extension gig, you need to go to grad school and you need to get a master's or a PhD. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. Career goal. I want that job. So I have to pursue that education. So I applied to a couple different schools and got into graduate school at Cornell University. And the program that accepted me worked on grapes. 
And I was like, sweet. My mom drinks a lot of wine. Oh, she'll probably hate it if she hears this, <laughs> this interview. She drinks a lot of wine. That seems like fun. And I really got into it. And I took a couple of viticulture classes while a grad student at Cornell working on my PhD in plant, you know, great diseases. And I was like, this is awesome. And so the, this gig at WSU, Washington State University opened up right when I was graduating, got the job, which was kind of amazing being fresh out of grad school and have been here almost going on 11 years you now. And that's kind of where I've gotten to where I'm at. This this indirect path of trying to not do anything I grew up doing to still not really doing things that I grew up doing, but very much related to kind of my background in agriculture. That's really cool to hear how all these different interests come together to sort of form this career. So you're up in Washington, which I know has been slammed with some really bad heat waves this summer. California, Oregon, and Washington are also the top three producers of wine in the United States. So how has this summer's extreme heat affected American vineyards? Great question, Ethan. Yes, and in many cases it has. But I think one thing that people tend to forget are grapes are pretty resilient, especially wine grapes. We've grown them for you know, since, since the, what feels like the dawn of time, it's, it's one of the oldest cultivated horticultural crops, right? There's uh, hieroglyphics in Egyptian tombs on grape production. I mean, we've been growing grapes for a long time. They're a weed. Grape vines are a vine. They're an exceptional weed that just has a really cool end product, right? So we got hot and we got hot earlier than normal and it was above our, our average temperatures, but we routinely hit that 106 to 112 degrees Fahrenheit in summers, right? That not in June and not 115 or 117. That was a little bit much. Um, but, but yeah, so with grapes, it's a lot about timing. So for us, it was after some pretty key plant development time. So that, that was okay. It did sunburn some fruit and in some cases, or if people weren't thinking about the weather or if they didn't have their irrigation um, system. So we're also fully irrigated. So that helps up here, or that's how we manage water up here. Um, so if they, if they weren't on top of their game that they could have been caught off guard, but a lot of people, at least in, in Washington have, have coped through that. And I think in, in California as well, the challenge with the heat, as you probably know, is when that's coupled with drought or restricted access to water. We don't quite have that yet. We do have water restrictions from time to time here in Washington state, but our water source is very different than what it is in Southern Oregon and in California. So we didn't have that coupling. Even with grapes being resilient, there are still a lot of ways that climate change can affect it. First off, growing seasons are earlier, too much water can cause problems, too little water can cause problems, worst frosts can cause problems. So how much does climate change play into the mind of wine grape growers that you might be interacting with right now? Have the effects been noticeable for them? So the idea of what to do in the, in the case of climate change, I think we have some idea by, by looking at grapes and how we've grown them. Because obviously we've gone through major climate shifts in the last, you know, six, 8,000 years we've been growing grapes. So we kind of have a, an idea with that. But I think the hardest part is people making those on-farm choices. So absolutely. So there's a lot of folks suddenly who are like, what do you, what do you mean I have to be more conscious on irrigation? Or what do you mean I have to install irrigation? I've always been rain fed. Well, the rain's no longer consistent. Or what do you mean I have to be much more conscious on where I'm planting a vineyard on my particular location? Because now I'm more prone to spring frosts, cold air sinks. So if I want to avoid that cold air, I have to plant my vineyard more up on a hill and I have to remove all those vineyards that have now been planted on a valley floor. I'm in a more extreme environment. So yes, some seasons are shifting earlier, but the fundamental challenge with climate change is the extremes, right? Right. It's not necessarily just the shifts. Shifts we can handle. We can anticipate shifts. Extreme changes are what we can't anticipate. So now I'm growing grapes in an area that maybe would have had cold winters, but not a big deal. But now that we go from a really hot January to a really cold February, that wakes the plant up and then they get damaged by cold. So now I'm going to suffer more cold damage. So there's a lot of that starting to boil or bubble up to kind of just get folks realizing what types of damage or long-term challenges, extreme shifts in environment can can do for for their production systems. And the other thing is, is maybe the answer is grow another crop or reconsider. And and that's that's where the human side comes in. That's hard because maybe that's a multi-generational farm 
or maybe that particular farm is a primary employer for a lot of people in the area. So if they go away, that decimates a rural economy. There's a trickle down effect right onto other families that are typically working or supporting that, that industry or all, all the tourism. That's also, you know, obviously winery is also coupled with tourism and in many rural locations, ag tourism is a primary driver for that area. So then what happens? Yeah. So they're thinking about it. And I think we're having more conversations on climate change. A lot of it on the VIT side is focused on when it happens, which is like, it's happening guys. It's not when it's now, when it happens, how, how do we respond to that? How do we anticipate that? How do we shift production styles? Do we have to consider new approaches? Do we have to consider new varieties? Do we need to modernize? Viticulture has really modern approaches, but we're really old school in some of our other stuff. And, and maybe it's time to, to reflect on that and change some mentality. Do you expect that these extremes and these variations could actually have a sizable impact on the industry to that extent? So the thing with humans is when one person leaves the party, another joins, right? So I, I think probably as a on, on a cumulative nation or global scale, that, that probably won't shift. And especially given that grapes are super resilient and, and, and can handle a lot of different environments. But I do see potential areas of that happening, that there could be shifts in that. And maybe it's the removal of agriculture and, and a refocus on something else. Maybe it's a shift in actual crops. So if someplace gets a little cooler, maybe instead of grapes, you're growing blueberries. I don't know. <laughs> it depends on what the market handles, right? Changing temperatures also make vines more vulnerable to pests, which I know you do a lot of work on. Many pests thrive on heat and moisture and higher winter temperatures could lead pests that were normally killed off to now survive. So what challenges does climate change present for pest control? So there's a particular disease that I work on called grape powdery mildew. It's one of the diseases that almost every vineyard in the world treats for. There are some exceptions to that. It can be managed organically. It can be managed conventionally, typically with organic um, programs. They can get pretty good disease control. They just have to spray more frequently with the organic products, with the conventional programs. They can spray less frequently. So the challenge with that is in Washington, maybe on an average year, we spray like six times for powdery mildew. Maybe, which seems like a lot until you hear what other regions do. <laughs> so we spray about six times in a really warm year when it's really hot and dry, we'll spray like three. In a cool, wet year, we'll spray like eight. So that's a general, general range there. In other environments that are much more humid, so average humidity of 60 to 80% in the summer, the temperatures that tend to be a little cooler, they can spray up to 15 times a season conventionally. Organic would probably be 20 to 30 times, depending on the products they're using for powdery mildew. That is a big difference, right? That is a big difference on the number of times you're jumping on your tractor. That's a big difference on the amount of product you're putting out onto the vineyard. The number of times a person has to be out there mixing that product and spraying it. I mean, <laughs> it's just, that's a huge difference and that's concerning. So if climate change results in an area getting more humid, they're going to have to start spraying for more diseases. And the more you spray, and this is the other type of, of stuff that I, that I work on, the more you spray, the more likely you can, um, especially if you're using conventional products, the more likely you are to potentially mess up, right? To spray the same thing too many times, to maybe not get really good coverage on your vineyard because you're driving too fast or you have to get through things quickly. And then the thing called resistance, fungicide or insecticide or herbicide resistance starts to raise its head. You can imagine when you're treating something five to 15 to whatever number of times a season, that risk of potentially getting fungicide resistance increases. And we've seen that in vineyards already in areas that do a lot of sprays, resistance starts to pop up. And then a couple things happen. They lose their crop because they get disease. They spray extra fungicides because they're trying to catch up and they never can. And that's just wasted product. And it's also extra pesticides in the environment that they didn't need to apply. And you get on this treadmill and then they stop using those and they switch to something else and they develop fungicide resistance to those things. And it's, 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 a, it's a weird cycle. So if in-season weather patterns start to shift, we start to see that more. And that can lead to inappropriate use of products, misuse of products, excessive use of products. And it's not because people want to. Nobody wants to spray things because it costs money, people, time, whatever. Everybody wants to put in as little as you possibly can. But when suddenly you might not have a crop, that's a big deal, right? When we're backed up against the wall, it's hard to see the long term. So whenever we do an episode on a food or drink, I hear people say they're afraid to listen to the episode because they think we're going to ruin it and tell them why we shouldn't have it. And that's certainly not an issue here, but is there anything that you think wine drinkers should know about wine that they might not already? 
one of the, I think the fun things that's coming out and I think part of it's in competition to some other adult beverages that come in cans now um, is canned wine. And there's a lot of sparkling and rosé options that are a lot of fun. And I know personally for me and my group of friends, what we love about them is light pack in, pack out. If you'd like to hike, right. You're going to go have a little picnic with the girlfriends or the dude friends and you're out there and you can crush that can in the end, put it, but you're not lugging around a giant glass bottle. Also good for, I know a lot of rural communities are really struggling right now in terms of recycling options. Um, We have that problem out here where we can't recycle glass anymore. And we used to a little bit problematic when you're in a wine region and you can't recycle glass. So that's been helpful. So that's kind of fun. I think the other thing too, with, with wine, I think the average wine drinker or people maybe who are interested in wine, I think get a little scared of wine in the sense that, because there's a lot of magazines and reviews and what you should and you shouldn't do and this and that, that kind of thing. But really wine, wine is a part of human culture. I and mean, I think if you step away from that mystique and just think of what wine is supposed to be, it's a, a food-based beverage that you're supposed to enjoy with friends and family and that it has a nice agricultural component. It's a perennial crop. So it's vineyards that get established and are there for a long time. When you start to kind of appreciate this product that has such beautiful history and interaction with humanity, and yet has some cool aspects that hold on to that tradition, but also are adopting kind of new innovative techniques. So you know what, drink what you like, but maybe take the time to think a little bit about how that fruit got into that bottle or into that can. (laughs) Dr. Moyer, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ethan. It's been fun. (laughs) This wraps up episode 57 of The Sweaty Penguin. Remember, you can get a shout out at the end of the show by leaving a five star rating and a review on Apple or Podcast Addict. That helps boost us in their algorithms. You can also get a shout out by joining our Patreon. And you'll get not just a shout out, but merch, bonus content, even a chance to win a signed book from one of our experts. Head to patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin to unlock all that cool stuff and help grow the show. Once again, The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next week. Today's episode was written by Megan Crimmins, Ethan Brown, Shannon Damiano, and Maddie Schmidt, fact-checked by Olivia Amate, and edited by Frank Hernandez. Our producers are Olivia Amate, Ethan Brown, Megan Crimmins, Shannon Damiano, Frank Hernandez, Dane Kim, and Caroline Kale. Our ads were voiced by Lindsay Cronin, and our music was composed by Brett Saka. Special thanks to our Emperor Penguin patrons, Lawrence Harris and Brownies Central. Clips today came from KCTV News, History with Jackson, TEDx Talks, Conservation International, and Quartz.